Claro que sí, Camilo. Muy buena tarde. Ya sumamos casi. Good 96. afternoon. Uh, we almost have 97 people. And again, uh, today we have uh, a, a talk uh, had with the Australian Embassy, and it is a great pleasure for you to be here with us. And the most important thing before we start, uh, there are several things. Uh, we are recording the session, and later on, uh, you, you can download it through um, YouTube and you will have a simultaneous interpretation with the panelists that we have today. I welcome Camilo Peña, who is the person who's gonna be with me uh, moderating, and uh, Madam, uh, the ambassador of Australia is here with us, uh, Mrs. Uh, Thompson, Erica Thompson. Uh, welcome, Mark Phil. Thank you for being here. And Camilo, let's uh, kick off now. Uh, the title today is it is uh, livestock management in extensive and sustainable and Camilo and for everyone here it's important to tell you that new technologies uh, where livestock sector uh, we have a clear object uh, which is productive uh, productiveness and to make it easier for the farmer. And we need to exploit natural resources. So today uh, they're going to give us a, a talk mindful of the environment and success stories in Australia. Good afternoon, Cam uh, Camilo. Good afternoon all. Uh, today we have a very interesting number of people. So far we have 131 people in Colombia and we hope that we have a very interesting session. As uh, you said, Sulam, um, uh, the um, ambassador Erica Thompson is here with us and she's very uh, mindful of our sessions and she wants to take care, advantage of all the Australian success stories that can, may benefit all the Colombian livestock uh, sectors. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce, uh, we're going to have two presentations today. The first one, uh, we are going to have uh, Phil Tickle, who is the founder of CycleLab, uh, together with uh, Pierre Scott. He has more than 30 years experience in the application of uh, aerospace technologies and also managing natural resources. And his mission is to focus uh, on uh, something new on um, livestock lands in Australia to take care of farms and to make it more, more sustainable. Uh, to uh, introduce him, uh, we need to see all the loads of uh, animals and that is critical for sustainable uh, livestock management and grazing industries. And uh, we need to respond to sustainable, I'm sorry, but he's breaking up. And this is why uh, uh, Phil, who is here on behalf of Cyber Labs, they use a combination of applications of uh, data compiling in farms with satellite images per week, uh, simple platforms uh, to take care of all this uh, grazing sector. And Phil is going to talk about that. And then after that, we're going to have uh, with, uh, we're going to have Mark Trotter, who is an associate professor at uh, the medical sciences in Queensland uh, University, which is one of the most important ones in Australia uh, for research. Uh, uh, are about variability with a special and um, temporal and um, the development. I'm sorry, he's breaking up before the variation uh, for animals. Uh, precision in grazing industries have transformed uh, all the industry in Australia. Well, they do that with uh, extensive grazing industries like with livestock. So Marco is going to tell us how these new technologies, emerging technologies are changing the way that uh, Australian farmers are monitoring their cattle. 
for uh, with a in a sustainable way, and we know, we hope that all these practices and and innovations in Australia are very useful for all of you in Colombia. So um, now I welcome our presenters. Uh, Sulam said uh, we're going to have simultaneous interpretation, so they you can follow it. And start your presentation. Thank you. Buenas tardes, everyone. Can you uh, see my screen okay? It's uh, slowly sharing. Yes, I believe we can see it now. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, apologies, I uh, don't speak uh, much Spanish. Uh, what uh, I'm going to be talking to, the, to you today about is uh, satellite assisted forage budgeting. Uh, CBO Labs was uh, established in uh, in uh, early 2018, uh, uh, but really was on the back of about 10 years of uh, work in uh, the remote sensing of uh, pastoral systems in Australia, and the realization that we really had to take some different approaches if we were going to uh, have an impact in the grazing industry in Australia. So what CBO Labs does, we're a satellite remote sensing and agricultural data science company, and we are providing services at the moment uh, to about 50 million hectares um, of individual paddock uh, pasture biomass predictions across Australia, um, largely across Australia's north, but also expanding into the southern uh, uh, pasture systems. And the sorts of questions that we're asking or answering are, how many kilograms of pasture do we have in a paddock or on a farm? Uh, how many grazing days do I have ahead of me uh, with or without rain? Uh, what is my land condition uh, in terms of uh, ground cover levels? And how is my ground condition changing? Uh, over time. We're also uh, uh, starting to work on soil carbon related projects. Um, there's a lot of interest in soil carbon globally and we're, uh, we're applying remote sensing to a whole range of soil carbon uh, projects in Australia at the moment as well. No doubt there are lots of satellites uh, uh, that have been launched in the last, uh, last five years. Um, I won't go through all of these in detail uh, but just to, I uh, suppose, I've provided some links there um, for you to, uh, to um, look at later on. Uh, and we, uh, we don't have a data problem anymore. There are um, literally hundreds of satellites uh, orbiting uh, the Earth, observing the Earth, uh, and we can uh, provide information uh, on a daily to weekly basis in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, land cover changes across the, uh, across the planet. The real challenge is taking that information and then providing it in usually use, easily used forms uh, to, uh, to provide farmers with better decisions. So what SIBO Labs does is really focusing on the, the data science, uh, um, looking at traditional methods of pasture biomass estimation and providing those uh, that information to producers uh, in an in a easily uh, uh, used form. So on the left hand side here, this uh, simple diagram here, uh, we've got um, highly sophisticated uh, uh, systems for automatically processing satellite imagery. So as I said earlier on, we're, we're currently imaging 50 million hectares of pastures every week. Uh, we have mobile apps that we provide to farmers um, to collect information in their paddocks and fields and farms. Uh, we have a machine learning platform that we have developed to uh, take that data collected by farmers and then uh, use that and the satellite inf information uh, together to predict the, uh, the, S the uh, kilograms of dry matter uh, of pasture in any in individual paddock and then to make that available into decision-making systems and software packages or spreadsheets or, or maps, a range of forms. What I thought I would do is just to quickly walk you through some examples. Um, this is a typical uh, image uh, that's provided to a farm. This farm is about uh, 10,000 hectares, um, but it doesn't matter whether it's 100 hectares or 1 million hectares, we can still image it. Uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, obviously clouds are the other uh, things that get in the way, but uh, techn technically we can image them basically on a sort of weekly basis. So what you're seeing there is a, is a 10 meter resolution multi-spectral satellite image processed for that property. 
uh, and uh, and you can see the uh, the vegetation. You can see differences in uh, in soil colour, um, and you can see basically down to individual trees. We run a model called a fractional cover model uh, that looks at the proportion of green photosynthetically active vegetation, the non-green or the dry vegetation, and also the bare ground. So we can see the dominant dynamics of how that uh, that pasture system is changing uh, through through the season, and and use this information to not only measure the amount of pasture but also the you know the general quality of the pasture. Um, and then we predict kilograms of dry matter. So in this image here, the, uh, the, the, uh, the brown areas are the lowest biomass and the green areas are the highest biomass. Uh, we can also tell you for any individual pixel how many kilograms of dry matter per hectare is actually in any in individual pixel. Um, this is just simply a web application um, that producers can basically have on their web browser or on a phone uh, to, uh, to look at the variability in, in pasture across each individual paddock. Um, we then produce traffic light maps. So again, uh, taking the complex information and turning that into simple information. Uh, here is a simple traffic light map showing the, uh, the highest biomass areas in green and the lowest biomass areas in, in red. Uh, and, and then you can also see uh, at the uh, top there where I can click on a paddock, uh, we can estimate the average kilograms per hectare uh, of pasture in that paddock for that given week. We also integrate that into uh, into other software packages. So uh, we work with companies such as AgriWeb uh, and uh, that, those farm management software systems uh, integrate our data into their platforms. So you can look at the individual animal data and the mob data and the uh, and the pasture data all in one all in one platform. The critical factor here, though, is um, is how to train these sophisticated machine learning models. And we're reliant on our clients and our customers basically helping us with this. Uh, we have mobile apps and we can provide um, uh, cattle producers in Colombia with um, these mobile apps and adapt them to your, the, your local conditions. But the core of our business is getting our clients engaged in the, in the process. This example here is actually a, a map of a client's property where um, they're collecting pasture assessment data uh, using a mobile app, which feeds directly into our machine learning uh, platform. Um, here's just an example of the uh, of the mobile app. Um, so uh, uh, to be able to take pictures, uh, to be able to do quadrats or visual estimates, um, to identify the species that are available there and the palatability of those species. Um, so this information is uh, is collected offline, so that the app works uh, offline with no reception. And as I said earlier on, this would be very, very easily adapted to, uh, to a Colombian circumstance for people to collect information and do their pasture assessments using this mobile app. That data then feeds directly to us. So as soon as you get, doesn't matter whether you're in Australia or Colombia, um, if you collected data, um, your, your, uh, your little dots would occur on, on the map um, here. And, and then we can start basically using that information to, to train the satellite data to predict kilograms of dry matter um, in Colombia. We're also using some sophisticated uh, computer vision techniques. Uh, this is about 12 months away. Uh, from production, but to be able to just to take a picture of a of an of a of a pasture and then automatically predict um, how many kilograms of dry matter um, is in that pasture. Uh, clearly, that's reliant on doing field cuts and uh, and observations as well. So it's about creating a library of information over time. And then you ask the question of how accurate is uh, what we're doing. So this is an example here where we've taken independent data. And, uh, and collected uh, data on a farm. Um, or, sorry, the farmer has actually collected this data. And then you can see on the top right, um, the sorts of relationships that we achieve uh, when, we're, when we're doing uh, calibration and validation at a, at a local level. Um, the past, uh, yes. Apologies, apologies to interrupt. Uh, some people are writing on the chat that the, the presentation looks very small. I think it's because you have selected the presenter view. That's why we see next slides as well. Would be possible ah. to right click and, and hide uh, percent of you so so it's uh, only one slide and it's bigger how's that permítame dar un anuncio también disculpe que lo interrumpa las personas que están preguntando sobre la traducción 
eh, simultánea, por favor, mirar en la parte inferior de su pantalla el mundito, el, el globito que le aparece en la parte inferior y ahí seleccionan el idioma español. Entonces, eh, pueden eh, seleccionar esa opción para, para poder escuchar la traducción en simultáneo. Solamente era eso. That's a lot better. Thank you, Phil. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. To <laughs> Apologies for interrupting. No. No, sorry, I, yeah, I should have done that before. I thought I actually was in screen mode, in full screen mode. Um, hopefully you've been able to see the, uh, <laughs> the slides until now. Um, so you can see here, um, we've got uh, past tropical pastures uh, there that are typically uh, over 5,000 kilograms per hectare of dry matter and, and, and even higher. And we have the ability to predict um, uh, biomass in those landscapes. Um, here's another example um, uh, uh, more recently as well, uh, taking validation data and you can see the relationship there with that scatter plot on the relationship between our field estimates and our predictions um, over a very, very complex landscape. And then nationally, um, we are, we're basically uh, um, rolling this out nationally now, so we have the ability to scale. Um, so we're, uh, we'll be in early 2022 who will have a system running uh, predicting kilograms of dry matter for every farm in Australia. So again, there's a signal there that basically at a country level, something like Colombia, um, we don't have scalability issues and the ability to do this. Uh, and uh, by middle of next year, we'll um, be looking at every single land parcel in Australia and providing information um, to, uh, to uh, people that want uh, pasture biomass um, for their individual properties. Uh, we can also go back in time as well. So the satellites we use now uh, to collect the information and, and uh, predict, under, under do, the, under do the predictions have only been available um, since 2015, the Sentinel satellites, the Landsat series of satellites got, that go back 30 years uh, and they're, they're available globally. Um, we're cross calibrating our models and that's going to allow us to run our models back in time and then look at the pasture production basically um, over the last 30 years. This has major implications on our ability to predict uh, soil carbon uh, based on, uh, on, um, on grazing systems and changes in grazing systems over time. So this will be a, an absolute game changer. Um, just to, to give you some sort of view of the Transportability, um, we're doing uh, trials in North America at the moment. So you can see the little dot um, there in uh, North America. We've got some trials starting in North America. Um, we've got some other trials in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa uh, and France uh, and, uh, and also Brazil. Uh, we're doing some, some work there. It's still very early days, um, we're, um, but we're working gradually to, uh, to uh, take our technology to, uh, to other countries and clearly uh, very keen to look at, uh, look at Colombian opportunities. Now, what I've just described there is, uh, is basically around our, our forage budgeting system. I also wanted to just show you briefly some of the new technology that we're bringing to bear as well. So recently we've become a partner to Ceres Tags, um, the world's first commercially available direct to satellite ear tag for cattle. Uh, and we have the ability now to track those cattle uh, on a three to four hour basis around the paddock. And you can see here the date of this image. Uh, I did a screenshot here two days ago. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at basically an individual animal um, at uh, 7.33 in the morning on a property about 2000 kilometers away from where I am right now. And, uh, and we're looking at a heat map there of the movements of those cattle over the last, uh, over the last 24 hours. We can also then look at individual animals and look at the activity of individual animals. So I'm looking there at, um, at one specific animal. It's actually had a high activity, a medium activity over the last 24 hours. And we can see where that animal has actually moved. And you know, this is going to be fundamental for understanding uh, you know, where animals are moving in the landscape and how much time they're spending across individual areas within a paddock, as well as their ultimately their health. And Mark's going to talk about that, I'm sure. But the real game changer for us, not only is the ability to integrate that data uh, in terms of specific applications around animal theft and animal health, but what we can also do now, and this is an example here of one of our clients where we have our pasture biomass predictions uh, that I was been showing you earlier and bringing those pasture biomass predictions and the animal movements together. So we'll be able to look at the pasture utilization across the 
paddock and start making predictions and estimates of, of how, uh, how, um, how animals are utilising the pasture across a paddock uh, and, uh, and, and what we can do from a management perspective or an infrastructure perspective, like fences and water, to improve the utilisation of individual paddocks. And just finally, um, I just wanted to quickly um, just talk about land condition and long-term land condition. We also have an application uh, in Australia, um, uh, which is taking 30 years of satellite data. So we can actually process data for every, pretty much every farm in the, the world for the last 30, 30 years. And we can look at changes in vegetation and changes in ground cover over those properties. And what we're doing here as part of soil carbon projects is uh, and land condition projects is benchmarking properties using time series satellite data and and uh, to I suppose there's a lot of complicated graphs in this uh, this slide here but on the bottom left we're looking at changes in tree cover over time uh, and very soon we'll be reporting directly on uh, on woody vegetation above and below ground carbon and generating reports for uh, for individual properties on on carbon sequestration and on the top right is basically a comparison where we're comparing an individual property to the neighbouring properties in terms of its ground, ground cover over time. And by doing this, we can then start to benchmark individual properties uh, in terms of their management practices. And on the bottom uh, right is an example there where we're taking uh, that time series data and then ranking um, that property to the neighbouring properties. And you can see there that um, that property basically was in the 50th percentile. So it was basically about the same or below the neighbours in terms of its ground cover management up until about 2010. And then, then, in, uh, then after 2010, they've, then, they've now moved up into the top 25%. And this property here has changed from cropping practices to rotational grazing practices. So this is, a, this is uh, also going to be influencing soil carbon production over time. And we're using these tools for registering soil carbon projects in Australia at the moment. Now, just finally, also wanted to just to touch on um, one of the biggest barriers to uh, technology adoption. We see all of this amazing technology, the satellites, um, the mobile apps, Mark's going to talk about sensors and IoT, an incredible amount of technology available, but it all comes back to the lowest common denominator. And at the moment, uh, we uh, have a very small number of farms in Australia that have a very high quality digital farm map. And if there was one thing that I could basically suggest in terms of trying to enable the, the, uh, the technology adoption, you've got to start with the, some of the simple things first. And without a digital farm map, we really can't fully uh, fully realise the benefits of all the other, other amazing technologies. So uh, we've built some systems uh, here in Australia to map property infrastructure or farm infrastructure, uh, fences, waters, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and do property plans. And again, this is global technology and could be easily adopted to, uh, to Colombian applications. But you really need to have this farm map before you can take full advantage of all the other technologies that I've talked about here today. Okay, I might leave it there. Um, so probably my sort of 15 minutes is up. Um, uh, I've provided a few sort of additional slides I haven't worked through, but um, certainly it's a very exciting times. Uh, and uh, you know we, we've, um, we're looking at a range of technologies that are really supporting forage budgeting in Australia. Um, as one example, uh, one of our key clients recently, a very large cattle producer in Australia, they were able to bring forward, um, they have six and a half million hectares of land. Uh, they have uh, about 400,000 head of cattle across the operation, about 20 farms and they were able to bring forward their forage budgeting by two and a half months. So rather than doing their forage budgeting in July, when a lot of the animal movements have already been made, they're now making decisions basically in April on our, on our information to, to, to drive their animal movements, which have a, a range of implications in terms of uh, risk management, uh, cost of transport, animal welfare, and a whole range of things by, by being able to make those decisions early. And then it's through uh, you know, applications like Ceres tags that we're really taking it to the next level now, uh, looking at real time, real time animal movements and, uh, and pasture, pasture budgeting going forward. So thank you for your time. Um, and we'll look forward to discussing our sort of expansion of these services to, uh, to South America. We're certainly um, you know, working on a range of fronts in the global sort of um, applications at the moment. So I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Phil. That was a very interesting presentation that was heard by uh, 306 
uh, people who are joining us uh, right now. Um, Buen público, Camilo, y público que nos acompaña a lo largo y ancho del territorio nacional. Great audience and people who are from all over Colombia and not only from Colombia, but also from Mexico. Uh, people are tuning in from there. And thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. And we thank those farmers who are here from different parts of the world. And uh, in terms of Colombia, the people from Cordoba, uh, in the north uh, of, of the country in Guajira, and we also thank you for being here, uh, people from, from Elgar, from Sucre. And thank you so much for being uh, with us today. I'm from Riohacha, the local project, Urabá, Antioquia. Thank you so much for being with us uh, in La Mojada, which is a very interesting part of Colombia and very productive. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Camilo, uh, you have the floor. Um, and uh, we have more than 300 people with us today. Okay, thank you, Sulam. So now we welcome uh, Mark Trotter. And as we said at the beginning, he's going to tell us about uh, the precision livestock management has uh, influenced uh, the, the industry of uh, crops uh, in and the extensive grazing industry. So I give you Mark. So he'll give uh, he start with uh, his presentation. Sure, let's see how that goes. Can you guys see that screen okay? Perfect, Mark. Excellent, righto. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking today uh, about uh, some other technologies um, that we're looking at um, applying in Australian extensive grazing systems. A um, little bit of, oh, hang on, I gotta get this working. A little bit of background on me first so i think it's always nice to know who's who's you talking to i, I grew up on a, a dairy farm and a commercial beef operation on the mid north coast of, of new south wales so that's in southern australia and then i um i went through university in that state uh, and worked in the um agribusiness industry for a little while and then i've just in the last five years moved up to to northern australia to CQ university which is based in rockhampton which is a more of a, a tropical um, type environment. Uh, uh, and so in some ways, uh, similar to, to, to Colombia in, in a lot of ways in terms of environment. Uh, I'll be talking today about some work that I've been doing, but there's a whole bunch of other contributors um, involved in um, this, in some of the work that we've been doing. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, those folks. Um, I'll, I'll talk today about two key technologies. The first one, and I'm only gonna briefly touch on this one, is our walkover way systems and then i'm going to focus on uh, some of the on animal sensing work that we're doing uh, and then phil talked a little bit about that earlier with the ceres tags just to start with though the walkover way uh, system this basically is essentially having a set of scales out in a paddock and the animals uh, come into the uh, in, into the paddock or come go into the water point through a set of uh, spear what spears so a one-way gate and they walk across this um uh, weighing platform and then that data is collected and sent back uh, uh, via radio link and so essentially what we end up getting is a, a live weight on a daily basis of each individual animal in that particular paddock and so traditionally we would have had to have mustered all of those animals brought them back to the yards and put them over a set of scales in the yards and you know we might do that you know once every three months once every six months or once a year if you're lucky but now I get a live weight um, for all my animals where they are out in the paddock. And just to show you what that sort of looks like, this is the, uh, the live weight of some cattle I've just got out the back of my office here and running in a small paddock. And they're com coming across that set of scales every day and I get that live weight update. And so you can see I've got animals ranging. I've got a bunch of heifers at about 450 kilo. And I've got one big old bullock at 840 kilos that struggles to fit up the um, in the yard every time we have to run, actually run him in. Um, so that's uh, that's just a little bit on, on walkover way. And we've actually got some projects over in uh, South America, uh, in Argentina, uh, looking at that technology over there as well. Uh, so be keen if anybody's interested to discuss some opportunities for looking at, at that technology uh, in Colombia. 
But the um, one of the key technologies that I wanted to focus on were these the on animal sensors. And so this is uh, essentially having uh, a smart ear tag, uh, we call them, uh, attached to an animal. And I'm going to try and hold that up, but my camera's probably going to block it. So you can see there, that's just a simple little, um, well, not simple, it's a, it's a smart ear tag that contains a, a tracking device and a radio transmitter that transmits that data back remotely so we can see what the animals are doing out in the paddock. So at the moment, uh, I suspect it's the same in Colombia. Our producers in Australia, we put cattle into a paddock and then we wonder whether they're okay. We don't really know for sure. But once we have these devices uh, up and working and um, then we're able to get that data remotely and actually understand and know for sure what's actually going on with that animal out in the paddock. And so there's a whole range of different applications. I'm gonna skip over that slide. It's a whole range of different applications of that. And I'm gonna run through that uh, shortly and talk a little bit, little bit about what producers are keen to use that sort of for. In terms of um, where things are up to um, in the commercialization space, there's a whole bunch of um, developers out there. Phil talked about Serastag. They're one of the leading companies out there developing the technology. But there's a range of other providers out there. So there's a company called Movement. Oh, there we go. That's their little tag. My camera does not want to play, play with that. So that's one of the other tags. Um, uh, AgTech 360 is another one. And uh, there's a, a bunch more out there. And um, in the last, say, maybe six months, we've really started to see a lot of these company, companies entering the market and they've got tags out on animals being tested and, and evaluated. And um, yeah, and we're certainly involved in, in some of that testing and evaluation. Just as a bit of an example, Phil showed you um, Ceres Tags um, platform before, which is, um, or Ceres Tags data integrated in with his platform before. Here's just another example of a, of a similar system from Smart Paddock. And you can log in and see where your animals are and uh, what whether they're in the right paddock or not the right paddock. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of more uh, or other applications beyond that um, that are of interest to producers. And, and that's the research that I'm involved in, looking at taking the data out of this and, and really turning into something more valuable uh, for, the, for the industry. So some of the work that we've done is actually um, simply surveying producers to help understand once they had this sort of device, if you had a, a smart tag that gave you the sort of data that you've seen, the location and the activity of an animal, how could you use it? And what we found was that um, producers have a range of different applications that they want to use this sort of technology for. Um, sim from simple things like water detecting water-related behaviours, have they got to the water trough and been able to have a drink or are they being held off or is there no water in the trough um, and issues like that, all the way through to more complicated things like um, uh, great understanding grazing distribution and Phil talked about that and there's some really big opportunities there in optimising our landscape utilisation. What I want to show you though is just some of the work we've done over the years where we've actually worked with producers to put this technology out and let them explore and understand some of the applications that have come to the to the forefront of their minds as they're using um, the data basically. So this was a, a property out at Longreach which is in western uh, far western Queensland so it's a rangeland almost not quite but uh, a real desert uh, low rainfall sort of area. And in this situation, we're tracking two different sheep and you can see one sheep in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. The green one has got into the water trough, which is in the blue circle, but the red one just walked straight past. And these were weaners, so they were a little bit stirred up and not settled down. And what ended up happening is that sheep in red actually didn't get into the water for three days because uh, he couldn't find it or was being pushed away by other animals. And so that's a real production and a welfare concern. And so producers are really interested in using it uh, for that purpose. Uh, some of the other things we've looked at uh, is uh, stock theft. And so stealing of um, cattle and sheep is a really big issue uh, in Australia. And in this situation, we actually had a, a farmer steal his own um, animals. And so you can see here the green trace, this is where the animals are just moving around the paddock quite happily and the red trace is are the, the records for where the farmer actually got in and started to move those animals to the fence uh, to box them up in a, in a set of yards and put them on his vehicle. And you can actually see him 
he stole his sheep and took them all the way to his neighbor's place to pretend like his neighbor had stolen his sheep. Um, but it showed us that we could actually use this technology to detect this particular uh, issue. Some other things we've looked at are detecting um, plant poisoning issues. So we have diseases caused by uh, plant toxicity and we can detect changes in animal behavior that are associated with those plant toxins and producers, once they know that they've got plants in a paddock that are poisoning animals, they'll pull those animals out or treat them accordingly. And, uh, and this is the one that uh, Phil talked about. And I, we know that there are some enormous financial benefits to getting this right. And this is about understanding landscape utilisation. Uh, so again, out in a rangeland environment, the, uh, the red areas are parts of the paddock that were underutilised by the animals. And the green areas were the areas that were used quite commonly by the grazing animals. And so what, uh, in this particular case, what that actually meant was the farmer decided to put a water trough up one end of the paddock to try and draw animals into that area that was, was underutilised. And there could be a range of different uh, methods or management strategies that you might um, use uh, to put in once you've got this sort of data. So it's, it's sort of, there's a whole different, a heap of different ways of actually using the information. But until you actually have that information, you know, we don't, we don't really understand uh, what we can do with it. Uh, some of the other applications that we're actually researching right now, um, some of the things that are happening as, as I sort of speak, um, beyond what I just talked about. So we do a lot of work in behavioural algorithm development. So some of the work we've been doing is in detecting the calving of cows automatically. So you can get an alert, say your cows are, are out there calving. Um, we do a lot of work in basic behaviour modelling as well. So just understanding what animals are doing when they're doing it. And that informs a lot of the other uh, behavioural algorithm development that we work on. Um, one of the key things that we're working on now is also dystocia detection. So not just when that cow's calving or when that sheep is having a lamb, but also if there's a problem in that process. And so you can be alerted to the fact that there's a difficult calving event actually happening out there. Uh, predation detection. So we actually have a lot of wild dogs in Australia that attack and kill calves and lambs and sheep. And so being alerted to the fact that there are uh, wild dogs attacking your animals and there's some big benefits uh, to that to be to allow producers to either go out and uh, directly shoot that animal or maybe target where they put baits out. Uh, and we do a lot of work now in, in disease detection. So we're looking at how do we use these um, systems to detect some of our endemic diseases. So things like uh, bovine ephemeral fever, three-day sickness, um, uh, foot rot, lameness in sheep and, um, and uh, worms in sheep as well, but also starting to look at how we can use the systems to detect some of our emergency diseases like foot and mouth disease as well in case there's an outbreak uh, in Australia. Uh, bull mating, so we're doing some work with um, uh, Ohio State looking at tracking the activity of bulls and determining when they're actually out there working or if they've broken down and they're no longer serving cows. Uh, but one of the, the, the main things we're looking at, and, and certainly Phil alluded to this earlier, is the idea of integrating sensors. So not just looking at um, one sensor system to solve the problem, but actually bringing data in from multiple places. And so having the livestock tracking data linked to the biomass data that Phil's generating, and also bringing in the walkover weight data so we know the productivity of these animals as well, and we think there's some enormous opportunities around refining things like when to move cattle from one paddock to the next, understanding where they're up to in that grazing rotation. Uh, but there's a whole heap of benefits to come from that data integration. So that's something we're looking at um, at the moment as well. I guess I just want to finish by saying that the smart tags that you see at the moment and the ones that are out there in the industry, um, we've really only just begun in that space, in that technology space. And so if you think about it, we're in terms of smartphones, um, you know, I walk around with one of the, the iPhones at the moment, a very clever device, but 20 years ago, you know, the, the best we had was a brick phone, a really large cumbersome type phone. And I think over the next five to 10 to 15 years, we'll see a real evolution in these smart tags as they get uh, smaller and more reliable and cheaper to be able to deploy on animals. And so we're really just at the beginning of this technology journey in terms of the, the smart, data, smart tags. That, uh, that pulls me up. Thanks, folks.
information was uh, really interesting. We have a few questions. So 319 participants uh, joining us uh, now. Sulam, eh, pasamos a la sesión de, de preguntas. Veo que hay algunas preguntas en el en Sulam, el should we start with the Q&A? Uh, there are several questions in the in the chat box. Uh, uh, Camilo, come again. Uh, you're breaking up. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I have a connection problem. We have some time for questions, and there are some in the chat box. So how about we uh, start with the Q&A? Uh, yes, Camilo, so, so we start uh, with the Q&A. Está por aquí. Vamos a mirar a ver si ya hay una pregunta. Ok, aquí hay uh, una primera. La uh, si quieres, le avisamos a, a Phil y a Mike para que cambien el idioma y puedan recibir las, las preguntas. Eh, Mark and Phil, uh, you, uh, if you need to change, Sulam will ask the questions in uh, Spanish, but for you to be able to hear in, in English, you need to change uh, possibly the language in the bottom part where it says interpretation. So you can, uh, you can hear the question in, in English. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mark and Phil, can you hear me in English? Yes. Okay. Uh, Andres Fernal has a question. In uh, mountain lands, when we are over 3,800 meters of altitude, do satellites work over there? Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, really the only uh, limitation is atmosphere. Um, so, uh, you know, cloud cover. Uh, and the ability to uh, to get through the clouds, uh, elevation is not a problem. Okay, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much uh, for the first speaker, uh, Hector. With your technology, how can we overcome meteorological problems like rain, sandstorms, fires? Yeah, so there are, uh, the satellites that I showed you were optical satellites, so they are dependent on, on having cloud-free imagery. The frequency of the satellites um, varies. Um, we have access to daily satellite data. Um, the satellites that we typically use are every five days, but we automatically detect clouds and cloud shadows and also um, atmospheric effects like fire to uh, um, uh, predict the quality of the data and then inform the user whether there are any issues with the quality of that data before they use it. Uh, but there are options for uh, for satellite for uh, for uh, satellite radar systems to uh, to overcome some of those issues. Okay, la siguiente pregunta para estas tecnologías debemos for this technology should we count on on good connectivity? I suppose I, I can answer that first, Mark, and you can. <laughs> so for the satellite data, um, uh, short answer is uh, is uh, connectivity is not really the major issue. Um, we process the data through high performance computing centers, and we only send very small amounts of information to the user. Um, so you don't need to have very big bandwidths to get access to our information. Um, uh, Mark, we also have the mobile apps. Um, the mobile apps work offline, and then and then you can collect information offline, and then bring that back and go back online to download the data. So, Mark might want to just talk about the sort of the uh, the IoT sensors. Yeah. So, the using the, the the animal tracking technology, connectivity is certainly a challenge uh, at the moment. There's a range of different solutions. If if you're happy to have, um, say, low temporal resolution data, so uh, a frequency of, of location, say every uh, four to six hours, uh, then um, Ceres tag um, is a direct to satellite connection. And so that really overcomes a lot of the problems that we have in terms of uh, getting data out of these difficult landscapes. Um, but yeah, in terms of the higher resolution um, systems, so tags that are working uh, to get a location, say every 10 to 15 minutes, then you need to set up a local um, farm network using what's called a LoRa uh, type system. 
And uh, that requires infrastructure and that does cost. And so there's some certainly some challenges around that. Uh, the, the, the in, all of these companies are solving uh, the problem in, in different ways, um, but there are certainly solutions out there that are working um, to some degree in, in, in very communication constrained environments. Just to add to that, um, with the Ceres tag application, its default uh, time period is, as Mark said, four to six hours, but it also does actually record baseline activity levels. And if, that, if the activity goes outside those baseline activity levels, it actually will transmit transmit more frequently and up to uh, 15 minutes um, if there is actually, you know, for example, if that um, tag has suddenly gone from being low activity to traveling at 60 kilometers an hour in a, in a truck, um, uh, our system will actually set off an alert and then, and then be looking at that uh, tag on a 15 minute basis um, uh, and sending alerts and emails to, uh, to, the, uh, to the owner of that animal or, the, or that mob of animals. Okay, continuamos con la siguiente pregunta. Uh, next question comes from Maria Escobar. Is it possible for those technologies to recognize the percentage of shadows in uh, grazing systems? Yeah, yes, uh, to, that's really part of our remote sensing science. So we, uh, we uh, correct for what they call bi bi-directional reflectance. So um, obviously every image has potentially trees and tree shadows uh, in it. And uh, what we do is, uh, is attempt to correct that information. So seasonally, um, we, we have an understanding of basically the proportion of shadow, for example, basically in those canopies that, uh, that uh, we also um, estimate the canopy density uh, and, and then use that to help us estimate um, what potential uh, pasture is under the canopies. Uh, based on on field observation as well, so it requires field data as well as the satellite information to uh, to uh, to understand the full picture. Um, uh, the satellite images do they have good resolution, a spectral resolution? That that's for you, Phil. So yeah, so. Um, we look at spectral and spatial resolution. So the satellite imagery that I was showing you there was basically 13 different spectral bands. So it sees um, uh, uh, um, parts of the spectra that our eyes can't see uh, and, and it's 10 meter resolution or 10 to 20 meter resolution, but you can still see individual trees, uh, large trees in that imagery. Um, as you increase your spatial resolution, so uh, Google Earth, for example, might be using 30 centimeter resolution satellite data, but typically that would only be four bands, and it has significant limitations in what you can uh, what you can analyze in that data. So we compromise by using the Sentinel satellites, which have um, 13 different spectral bands of information and 10 meter resolution for which for management is typically uh, typically good enough. But obviously clouds, if when clouds are an issue, we might need to move to daily data, uh, which has um, higher resolution and higher frequency, uh, but lower spectral uh, reg uh, resolution. Okay, uh, hacen la siguiente pregunta, uh, The next question, uh, a satellite system to monitor animals. Uh, how much is the cost in American dollars? And they also request data for, uh, do you have a website, uh, an email address that where we can contact you? Yeah, so um, cbolabs.com.au um, with Ceres tags, you can go straight to the Ceres tag website, uh, which is uh, uh, cerestag.com. Um, and uh, they have uh, basically introductory packs of, uh, of, uh, of tags there. Um, you can go and have a look and just confirm the prices. I won't confirm it here now, but um, uh, you can buy uh, packs of uh, sort of, I think 10, 10 or 24 tags to start with in an applicator um, to get you going to trial the technology, which is what a lot of our clients are doing now is they're buying small groups of, you know, small boxes of tags, putting them on some breeders, putting them on some bulls, and then starting to learn how to, uh, how to use the technology. 
Uh, and I'm right now looking at a property, um, you know, 2,000 kilometres away and looking at, um, you know, effectively what animals have actually moved into the waters basically in the last sort of in the last 24 hours. So it's, it's live data. It's three three thousand dollars, Bill, the US for the um uh for that starter kit. Yep. But like I think as as Mark mentioned, I think it's really important here where um uh every type of farm has different applications and different priorities. And just like Mark was showing, you know, the big brick phone, um, I think we've all got to um, sort of step in there and start, you know, using the technology. And it's only by using it. Uh, and and getting feedback to these sort of providers that the price will come down, obviously. So uh, there's no point waiting until it's perfect because if you wait till it's perfect, you'll actually, well, firstly, it'll never become perfect because you haven't been involved in its development. And secondly, if you don't, if you're not an early adopter, it's actually very hard for companies to, you know, fund the development of that work. So it's really dependent on, you know, the industry such as the cattle industry really sort of, you know, taking these sorts of new innovations and and trialing them and then working with the uh, the company companies to and the universities you know the researchers to develop that technology into, into what it needs to be in the future Sulam rápidamente Camilo, uh, you have some announcements um, I would like to remind all participants with us today that from the Australian embassy we're going to send an email with a recording of all of the presentations and additionally with resources uh, about the educational offer, product and services by diff different Australian companies and data contact. Uh, and we can check that later. And I second that motion because uh, later uh, we are going to upload uh, this recording in the Fedegan YouTube channel and you may console that to double check and answer your questions. Um, let's see one of the ones that we had in English. Uh, it had to do with cost. Uh, the one in English had to do with cost. So I think we already answered that one. Uh, in terms of the satellite, so uh, Mark talked about the tags. In terms of our satellite service, uh, typically, um, the uh, minimum charge at the moment uh, is uh, 1,000 Australian dollars per year for uh, five for um, uh, uh, five daily satellite imagery. But again, it's basically it's all about scale, and and then so we're looking at a whole range of uh, collaborations and partnerships with others that will help us uh, drive that price down. Uh, you know, by improving the sort of the you know, the transaction, you know, minimising the transaction costs. So. Um, as one example of that, um, by the middle of next year, SIBO Labs will be providing every red, moose, uh, red meat producer in Australia with, a, with free access to components of what we're doing um, at a farm level. So every, every month to provide every red meat producer in Australia with an estimate of how much uh, uh, pasture they have on their property at, at a property level or a farm level. Okay, vamos a hacer We have another question. Uh, taking into account uh, your answer, wouldn't it be more useful to, do, to use drones, algorithms, and computers to predict the, the amount of uh, dry matter and the nutritional value of, uh, of different pastures? I would say drones would be the most expensive way <laughs> of doing this. Um, you have to buy the drone, you have to buy the batteries, you have to buy operators to use those drones, and you can only cover very small areas. So typically, um, you know, if to, co to cover hundreds of hectares in a single day, you would need to have a drone worth you know, many tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and uh, and then have a an operator to uh, to to uh, use those drones and then to process the data. So uh, I would say that the satellite options are many hundreds, if many not many thousands of times cheaper than any any drone application that uh, in terms of extensive pastoral uh, systems. Okay, aquí hay otra pregunta. Uh, there is another question that has to do with technology. Uh, 
the technology that is uh, monitoring different bovines, doesn't it mix them up with other animals in the farm? Uh, I can probably just ask from, answer from a Sarah's tag perspective. So we have the individual animal tags. Uh, we have the, uh, the device tag as well as the visual tags. Um, so we're, we're actually able to uh, look at individual animal uh, tracking over time. Um, maybe your question is perhaps more on the um, whether you want to need to tag every animal or only maybe a proportion of those animals. And what we're seeing now is, you know, most people looking at perhaps tagging the very important animals, but also then looking at a smaller proportion of their mob to look at what the, the overall mob activity. Mark, you might want to um, um, answer some of that as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one last question. Uh, you're going to elaborate. Okay. No, no, let's leave it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no? Adelante, si desea. Okay. Um, Buenas tardes. Eh, este sistema está diseñado... Is your system designed to observe behaviors and habits? Can you estimate uh, production? and uh, pro milk production or dairy production or weight production. Can you detect that also? Mark? Yeah, so certainly at the moment, we can use that walkover way system to directly detect live weight change in beef animals out in the paddock. And, and that's part of what's there to do. The challenge is that's a quite expensive piece of equipment. And so what we're hoping to be able to do um, in the medium term, medium long term, is to actually use the data that Phil's generating with the pasture biomass and integrate that in with the animal behaviour, which gives us some indication of how they're uh, how they're grazing using that landscape, which gives us a bit of an indication of the nutritional quality of that um, pasture, and then use that to predict the live weight of animals, and so. Um, or the live weight change of animals, I should say, the growth rate. And uh, one model we're looking at is to um, have distributed uh, walkover weight platforms in different um, regions and then use those to ground truth the predictions. Uh, but that integration of, of remote sensed vegetation data and the high quality um, data that Phil's putting out with animal behaviour, we believe, or at least we hypothesise, that we can actually get towards predicting uh, live weight change in terms of beef production, at least. Yeah, we're we're also very excited in um, these extensive grazing systems around uh, uh, supplementation. Um, a lot of our uh, pasture systems, depending on seasonal conditions, obviously the quality of the pasture varies, and 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 then what those animals eating are eating in terms of its nutritional value varies. So to be able to use this sort of information to then target. Uh, where and when to put in supplementation like lick and those sorts of things could have a, a fundamental impact on uh, on live weight gain in some of those systems as well. Camilo, uh, Camilo those were the questions that we had. There are some that had to do with the value. So since we already answered that in terms of cost, uh, uh, maybe uh, that answered the questions that they had before. So uh, we should close. Uh, uh, should we give them some additional data where you, they contact our uh, speakers and we can close today? Uh, Perfect, Sulam. Uh, uh, Mark uh, gave them some links in the chat box, but we are going to send the recording of this session to those people registered uh, with additional resources, contact information, uh, educational offered products and services, so they can look more in depth uh, what is the Australian offer and the opportunities uh, there are for uh, collaboration uh, with collaboration with Australian in, in this moment. So we want to thank you for being here. Thank you, Camilo, uh, for being with me today, and uh, Madam Ambassador uh, Eric at Samsung. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to see you again after a while. And on behalf of Fedegan, uh, we are going to develop these spaces that uh, are filled with uh, knowledge and applied uh, and uh, with uh, success stories. And thank you so much to our speakers today. Mark, Phil, uh, good morning to you. And uh, this is... Uh,
uh, we're almost at night time. It is 6 p.m. Colombia time, and we still have more than 260 people. We are very pleased by the number, and thank you all for being with us uh, throughout uh, Colombia and the people who join us from different countries. Uh, good evening, I'm Sulam Atum, and I hope to have you very soon. Good afternoon.